reflecting on all of the experience you've had within the army and now out, mm-hmm. there will be military applicants, there will be military personnel, there will be operators listening to this. What are the biggest mistakes that you see people making along the way in terms of their fitness? But let's look at it from, from two angles, in terms of getting in, getting your foot in the door in the first place, because we look after a lot of athletes all over the world that are in a tactical space as well, and there's a lot of common ones. So getting in, getting your foot in the door in the first place, and then more importantly, maintaining it as you go once once you're in, because operational fitness is a lot more varied than I think traditionally it's being considered. So from your experience, having walked the walk and actually talked the talk and done every element of it within that space specifically, what are the common mistakes that you see made from applicants and then soldiers? Two, two common mistakes. They're either underprepared or overprepared. Predominantly, what you see is people join the military, so taking your first step in tactical athlete development. People predominantly are underprepared. Those taking their next step in tactical athlete development, so going on a P company, a commando course, a SF selection, whatever, whatever their, their, their um, relevant course is, they're overprepared. So what they do is they people going on UKSF selection pretty much do selection before they go on selection, and then they turn up and can't understand why their knees have popped, and it's just like because you you're putting that much stress through your body that now you're asking it for more stress when it matters. So um, that they're they're the two main things that you always see, and so whatever I ever do is um, especially those joining the military. What you got to remember is when people join in the army. They're going to go through basic training where they're going to make them into soldiers. So you don't have to turn up a soldier. So all you have to do, and this is this is how this is how I changed the Army Foundation College. This is how I, I the the programs I put in place there was what they was trying to do was first and foremost they was trying to um, train them as an adult. Then they tried to train them as kids which there was like nothing. So it was basically all fluffy. People were throwing yellow cards up to like commanders and stuff. And then they was turning up to Power Edge Depot and getting hit like a freight train. Like that bloke did hit me in rugby. And they just couldn't handle it. So everyone was failing. So what I then turned up, and I know there was a lot of science involved in it. I turned up, I understood peak height velocity and I looked at maturational status and noticed there was a window of opportunity of testosterone levels in 16 year olds where we could make them absolute monsters. But predominantly it was about it wasn't about making them paratroopers, so only a few of them want to go and join the parachute regiment. My first cohort was 20 people wanted to go, and there's like 1,800 people in camp. Um, of uh, That's not just junior soldiers mixed, but 20 people is quite a, a small amount. So I created this program called Op Achilles, and I didn't name it, by the way. I hate the name. Um, some commander probably got an MBE for that, but it's a um, yeah, <laughs> dreadful name. And uh, I don't even know what, what how it's relevant to the parachute budget, but I have no idea. Reinforcing but, people's ankles? I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, well, we did, actually, so fair one. But uh, what we did is I, re- I realised straight away that people have tried this before, and what they've done is, you're right, you've got to, so I've got to create this programme that's external to their normal programme. And I was like, okay. So the problem is no one's passing parachute regiment training as a junior soldier. And they're all failing maybe because they're not good enough or fit enough. I said, okay. So what we're going to do, I want, I want you to do 12, you've got 12 weeks from, from the last 12 weeks of training. I want you to create a program. And I was like, okay, so I can't do it in work hours because they've got the normal program. So I was like, so it's early mornings, late nights, brilliant. Um, great for me. But more isn't always better. So just adding three extra sessions a week for 12 weeks. So doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a better product. So I was like, so I had to start managing. That's when I really started delving into the science of individualization and training. And I created this program whereby we just not only did it do the maturational stuff we've just talked about, but I was focused. It was athlete led. I treated these kids like athletes, like they was at an academy. And up the scoff, so I wrote to uh, Defense Naval, I think it's called, where it's like the, that's, that's who determines how much calories each soldier gets. Wrote to them and said, we're doing this, we're doing that, and managed to get it ticked off that now everyone on this Op Achilles pathway would get a fourth meal in the night. That was twofold. Not only did I want extra calories because I was training them more, and we wanted to do hypertrophy, build the muscles. I'll come on to why. But I wanted to sit them all down together. So in Harrogate of 1,800 people, these 20 people spread out across everyone. So the first time they would see each other was at Power Edge Depot normally. Now, 
that wasn't okay so what i thought is strength and numbers if they know each other they're less likely to fail they'll hold on to each other and my 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 rationale behind it was um whenever they get on the stretch race for example on p company if you know that bloke to your right you're more inclined to stay on because are you really going to give him 100 percent of your weight are you going to come off because he's that that stretcher still has to go are you going to give that man all your weight now if you don't know him you won't care but if you do you're going to stay on it so I thought, I'll get them all together and start eating together. Build the psychosocial element of training. Um, so what we do is have, we would go and have a meal. And during that meal, I'd bring in uh, paratroopers to come and speak to them and talk to them about. I'd bring in instructors from depots as a familiar face when we got there. And it was, you know, we built this, built this program. And what I found is that the program wasn't designed to make them paratroopers. It was designed to make them survive. Because I remember all those years ago, it's about survival. The fittest people failed when I went through training. They all failed because they just couldn't, they couldn't survive. They, they was too, almost too fit. They peaked that week in the first couple of weeks. And I was thinking, my God, they're miles ahead of me. And then all of a sudden they're on their way down. You, you understand periodization. They're on their way down. They've, 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 they're knackered. They've got nothing else to give. Where I'm like that, I had nothing to start with. So I'm just going up and up and up. And it peaked at the right times. And uh, so my idea was it, right, I'm not building paratroopers. I'm going to build a soldier with a solid foundation of strength and give the instructors at Parareg Depot a platform to build them. That's it. So when, that's all I want you to do. I want you to create you where you can, they can throw whatever the fuck they want at them. They can do whatever training they want at them. They will not break. We will not get an MSKI. So MSKIs went down to zero, where predominantly that was the biggest reason why people was failing. None. And all I did was build these young lads to be so strong and stable that whatever they got thrown at them, it was easy. The fitness would get taken care of because they would have a foundation to build upon. Parareg Depot would do that because I'd been part of that program two years earlier. And and it worked. So we got we then that when those lads then got to P Company, they are they had an eighty eight point five percent pass pass rate across all these cohorts. So I did loads and loads of up Achilles. 88.5%. So I was like, right, 16 year old kids have now got a nine out of 10 chance of passing the physical standards of Parachute Regiment Depot. That hadn't been done before. It was like, and so it started off with 20 people. My final cohort of Op Achilles had 88 people. So now not only are we putting more people on seats, and not only are they now passing, we're getting a higher percent of passing. These kids are available. The, the best ability we own is being available at all times for the next 20 years. You're not getting some 34-year-old bloke who's just crawled over the line at Paravex Depot because his knees are given out, but he's passed. You're getting 16-year-olds who are ready and available for years and years for you to mould into whatever the fuck you want. And you can throw whatever you want at them, put any sort of load on them. They will not break. And that's how Op Achilles was found. So that's the, And I built that in a sense of we're, we're not going to overtrain. So going back to a, a long-winded, going back to the original question, we need to basically just build a foundation, give the instructors a platform to build upon. We can train hard later down the line. We can optimize human performance later down the line. Right now, let's ensure that at all costs, we can stay the course. Whenever I do any sort of training programs, first for any sort of course, any sort of project is first and foremost, we must stay the course. Because if we stay on the course, we've got 100% more chance of passing. Because if you break, no one cares how fit you are. It's irrelevant. If you, if you, if you fall short on P company because your knees gave out, no one gives a fuck how fast you can run. No one cares. No one's going to remember you. No one's going to go, yeah, but he would have passed P Company if his knees didn't go. It's irrelevant. No one cares. So first and foremost, we stay the course. We stay injury-free by ensuring that we never, ever get an MSKI. And that's what I did with Op Achilles. And it worked. They built the paratroopers. I just gave them a foundation. Remarkably effective. And actually, when you distill it down into the elements that, that were missing beforehand, it's actually just applying... As you said, athletic logic. How do we get the best out of athletes in a professional sporting world? How do we apply that to the, the tactical athletes? Because that's exactly what they are at this critical point in time where we can mold them into whatever we want them to be. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the biggest. I mean, we, we, we've got we've got SF all over the all over the world, and we've got we've got people applying for the Marines. We've got every age group of people in there. People people um, that have passed out hills and whole variety. And generally speaking, when people come to us, Zone Two is what's missing. The the demand for I'm gonna every run I do I'm gonna do it full send with a weight vest on. Why are my hips so ruined? Why do I feel so battered? Every every long rock at the weekend is gonna be at 
at sort of race weight, shall we say, where you're using what you're going to be using on the hills. And as you said, you're broken before you get there. So you want to get to the, you want to get to the standard where you can tolerate what the course is going to throw at you. This is from my perspective as a civvy, my thigh I don't want to get waltzy at all. But um, as a civvy, the perception we've got is that it's the ego and the intensity. And I think you've always got to be working harder than the guy next to you that is ultimately the biggest limiting factor. So if you can remove the ego from that, and allow them to understand the trajectory upwards, as you said, it means that the crash downwards isn't going to be as aggressive. Because as you said, putting people around for dinner, putting people around doing things together, supporting the guy next to you, that is going to wear down that masculine ego that you'll get a lot of in that space. And I think this is what applies in a civilian environment as well, because you put that into a business setting, you put that into a friendship setting, and it means you're just more intuitive with those around you. You actually know how to get the best out of the person next to you. You know how to get the best out of yourself. You know when you're working too hard. You know when you're burning the candle at both ends. And you don't let that arbitrary, I've got to be doing the most, I've got to be working the hardest. You've got to be working the smartest, and you've got to be reflecting on what you're doing. And that's how you get the best out of yourself long term. And then, as you said, once you've got those foundations nailed, that's where you really start to look at, right, how can I nail this next 1%, that next 2%, that next 3%. And I think there's a bit of a culture in the fitness industry and and people that have got a growth mindset as a whole worldwide at the moment where everybody's looking for a for a 1%er before they've got the foundations nailed. Which yeah. sleep supplement should I be taking when I only sleep four hours a night? Well, should be sleeping should be sleeping more first and foremost, my friend. It's it's little things like this that you see a lot of. Yeah. Though it's um or or the or the the incessant desire to optimize quote unquote recovery when you're doing double sessions a day, seven days a week because you yeah. like training hard. You can't recover from being tanked all the time by getting in an ice bath. You need to program more effectively. But this is probably a rabbit hole that we're not going to go down. Otherwise we'll uh, we'll end up we'll end up fairly deep into yeah. it, I'd imagine. So I think it, it's fascinating to just hear that actually you brought together all of the human elements of training and that is what ultimately brought the best out of these individuals. That is trying to get that over the line though. When people were seeing what I was doing at the start, um, the people, the hierarchy, the you know, it was people was like, "What are you doing? Why are you doing that?" Um, and it was only because Power Edge was really supportive of me. And I just, I just created this uh, another program uh, uh, six months before. It's one of the reasons why I got this job. Talking about AFC at this time, where I got a hundred percent pass rate of every person on camp of physical tests, physical standards no more injuries and everyone was upskilled and, and what's known as MFD. So they medically fit to deploy. And I did that through individualizing training. So I had a, so people was already, you know, just give them a chance. And I was really fortunate that I've, I've fought my way through and, but trying to get that over the line with the dinosaurs was just outrageous when they realized that, you know, what, why aren't we running? They need to be tabbing more. Uh, so up Achilles is still going and they've just sent their lads up there and they've just, they were talking about, they just now just, finish their what another test that they do up there is a two miler sub 18 minutes carrying um around about 20 kg and every single person come in under 16 minutes 16 year olds and they don't and they was like oh it's amazing you know it's you know it's really good we're getting a really quality standard and it was like they've done one loaded march on up achilles one and it's like this is so me trying to get that signed off two years earlier when I'm telling them, no, we ain't going doing loaded marches every day. Because that's what they was going. No, the reason they're failing is because they need more. They need to they need to get un- under load, under the burger, needs to be doing more tabbing. And I was like, okay, leave it with me. And I'm and then they come into the gym and I'm doing like the bird dog with them. And they're like, what's going on in here? What's happening? And I'm like, oh, this week we're doing velocity-based training. They're like, nah, never heard of it. Not doing that. Don't like it. And I'm just like, just just give me a chance. <laughs> fortunately, I fortunately did. And then obviously... um when pass rates rocketed, people start believing that. But not only was the hierarchy believing, I couldn't get that the junior soldiers were. This was catching on. And I said, right, we are, I got them in this room and I was like, we are different. If you want to be a paratrooper, you have to be different. You want, you want to, you, your why has to be so strong. If you don't want to be here, go now. Save everyone time. Walk out the door now. Go and join a different unit. It's no, it's no hardship. There's no hard feelings. No one's going to take the piss out of you. And then this is where the secret athlete concept came to. I said, right, we are different. And I want you to believe that. You are better than everyone. And if you believe that, it's great. However, you are not a paratrooper yet. So you do not walk around this camp and you do not belittle anyone. And now I'd have this bigger horizon of the military and I had a better understanding that you know, other units are really good as well. And I've got really close mates in, in loads of other units. And I was like, 
You do not belittle anyone. You train in silence and you win in silence. You are not a paratrooper yet. So you walk around here and you help everyone and you're there and you, you still win. Find a way to win. Be the best at everything. But I want you to do it in silence. I want you to be humble about everything. And that's where the secret athlete concept started coming from. I was like, what we do in this room doesn't leave this room. What we do in training doesn't leave the training. If you, people's back squats were like going through the, because you obviously you start doing specific training with people with a low training age. We both know numbers go through the roof. And I was like, don't tell anyone. Great. You know, shake it, shake, shake your partner's hand and that's it. It's done. Well done. You just doubled your back squat, but we don't talk about it again. We just utilize that as a model to train from. Um, and that's where the secret athlete concept started coming from. And that became really, really powerful. You could see chests getting bigger. You could see people growing, you know, and, and at the end, what they do is they get, they get, uh, fitted out with their kit before they then go into phase two. So what I was trying to do is basically bring everything over. So the transition was really simple. It wasn't just a physical pathway. I was trying to do loads of stuff. So their coat, their instructors would come over and they'd fit them. And the lads were in the gym with their tops off getting fitted with all their, their new vertex kit. And it was just like, and I could see the instru- these people were jacked. These 16 year olds were jacked. And I was like, we've done well here. And, and yeah, and he was just ready for it. And he was ready for absolutely anything, which is the parachute regiment motto. And he was good to go. And we just, we created these monsters, these secret athletes that were just ready to, whatever you've thrown at them, they was good to go.